Now we have three different machines here and this one here is a disc ripper that they ran about 12 inches and what I want to show you this is put at, at the soil surface here is 12 inches okay is it going to 12 inches no the other thing that I notice um, is how far tillage throws soil and I didn't realize that just doing the tillage plots that we do um, but look how far this has thrown the soil up to you know eight feet if you look you can see the sand layer up that far did you realize it threw it that far forward so you know because I didn't <laughs> um, and then this uh, this one does a more of the mixing this one's a disc ripper and so you have the big shanks up in the front lead shanks and another set of shanks and the the discs in the back and discs what they do is uh, they tell the soil where to cut and where to shear whereas a, a chisel point will come up and lift the soil naturally and let it fall more on its natural planes so when you go to a road that's being constructed what do you usually see sitting out there a disc yep big disc <laughs> exactly and then this pit here or this pass here was a zone tiller it was set at 14 although he wasn't sure it was it was getting that deep 14 inches is right here and which is about right at this layer here can you guys see this layer here and it's not quite getting there and I can't even really find them every 30 inches apart so it's not doing quite what we wanted it to do and then this one over here is the moldboard plow anybody use the plow oh okay because you should have been here because they were all like how do you how, nobody knew how to run a plow and I was like wow that's awesome <laughs> um, well most of the guys around here are disc rippers so but this one is said he couldn't get it any deeper than eight inches and here's eight so he was doing a good job now the other thing about moldboard plow and when I go into soil pits I can always tell where the plow uh, that you use to plow and why would that be no not you know one guy said plow sole and the last one I said I, I, I didn't know what a plow sole is it's a plow pan I was like I got it now I got it so um, yes and no but what you'll find is it's really good at inverting the soil over and so all the residue that's up here will come down to the bottom here and what you've done is taken now most of your residue is going to decompose because of bacteria and fungi they they munch on it and so when you take those and they love oxygen so when you take them and you turn them all the way over you just put them in an area that's not oxygenated so they're not going to break down the residue the same way so when you till again and you bring it back up they'll say it's the same color as it was when I put it down well that's because nothing was living down there to take care of it what is compaction compaction is just the loss of pore space okay when you have an ideal soil you have 50 percent of sand silt and clay your soil and within that soil you'll have pore space and you want half of that pore space filled with water and half of it filled with air and that would be an ideal condition for root growth plant growth um, bacteria all of them they really like this situation here when you compact a soil you lose the air because you can't squish out water although we were trying to do a good job of that yesterday <laughs> so now when you have a soil that's full of more water you get problems with not enough oxygen in there and your roots like it remember you need it you, well look at your soybeans oh that's gonna be warm um, you know the little nodules down there that's bacteria right rhizobium uh, pull up your soybean plant and see how far down it's nodulated because they need oxygen and if they're only living up in the top area they're not getting oxygen down here so they'll only live where there's oxygen if you do that you also set yourself up for more diseases if you have sugar beets this is wet soil is not a good thing and they're showing that on quite a few different crops not just um, with sugar beets so this is a, what compaction does and your number one defense natural defense against compaction is structure and what structure is it's not going to be over here because we pulverized it structure is these little aggregates that are in the soil and now if they're bigger than the size of a pea that's a clod these are aggregates these are good 
and this acts as mini columns in the soil and it helps hold up the weight of equipment so you know it it rebounds for you now when you till you just destroy structure right you break it up more and more as you till and when we till the whole one of the big ideas for it besides residue management is to get air in there because air warms up so quickly and helps your soil warm up and we can get out there I mean that's why we like it but what's the load bearing capacity of air <coughs> not much <laughs> None. right so you're taking out the natural ability of the soil to resist compaction and you're replacing it with air so what I try to help guys do is just reduce your tillage as much as you can If you have a well-structured soil versus a poorly structured soil like this one here, you also get, besides clods, when those clods break down, they're more individual particles, where you know here you have more of aggregate. So which one blows more in the wind? Easier to blow, right? Easier to move with water. And the one thing that um, is getting more and more attention is that tillage erosion is actually more erosive than wind and water erosion together. And you can see that I mean, like I said, look how far it moves that soil forward. Look at the sand layer, because there's no sand in the real soil, and it moves it up. So, um, you know, you got to be a little aware of that. And we, and we did try to get up to speed for these. They were trying to go six miles an hour, so they backed up as far as they could and just now. Another problem with compaction, there's different kinds of compaction. One is uh, when you get crusting on the surface, that's... Uh, surface compaction. And then you also can have wheel traffic compaction. I see that in every soil pit I go into. If you dig out four rows of corn, you will see um, a wheel traffic in there. And it looks just like a U shape. And, and sometimes if it cracks right, you can actually take it and just lift it out and give it to them and say, here's your wheel traffic. Um, I can also show them their tillage layers. I know exactly how deep they go and, um, and how it's mixed. I can tell which piece of equipment usually and the depth. So what tire traffic does is if you see the normal pattern of root growth, they go at a 45 degree angle when they start growing and then they fill in this area over here as they keep growing throughout the year. And when you have wheel traffic, especially if it gets dry because it will get as hard as a rock, um, your roots cannot go over there to explore this area. Now this area is important because most of you broadcast and incorporate, right? And that's at the top six to eight inches is where all your nutrients are sitting. Well, if your roots can't explore that area, you're missing out. So, um, and also water. They can't get into this little areas here. This one has compaction on both sides. I usually don't see that. I usually just see a set of tires, one every four. It depends what kind of equipment you have out there. So we wanna make sure that we can take care of that. Another form of com uh, compaction is uh, we have the surface, we have the tires, and then we also have a, a plow pan. And most people, you know, like Delon's been in a lot of pits with me, we hardly ever see the a plow pan anymore. And mainly because most of you guys are not doing just chisel plow year after year after year. You've gone to something deeper, that one. And it's just broken up that plow pan for you. So if you keep on with the disc ripper continuously, you will start forming a plow pan at that depth. So I like to see variable depth tillage out there. You know that if um, you're in beans, you don't need it quite as heavy. Or you can, some people can go no-till beans. I like no-till beans. Or just a light pass with a vertical till or something like that. And then if you have the corn, do the heavier tillage. You know, or if you're on the sands, do lighter tillage. But just think about each field is different, right? Well, gosh, that side of the field to here is different. Um, you know, that, it, I understand, it gets difficult. So some of the weights that are out there, two things do compaction. One, well, three. One is going on a soil when it's wet. But, you know, sometimes we don't get that choice. We go when most of the field is fit, the rest of it may not be, but we got to plant and we got to harvest. And if we kind of muck up the soil, that's, we got to do that. And I understand that very much. But the two things you can control, is your PSI and your axle loads. And um, the axle loads kind of does the depth of compaction, the PSI gives you that intensity. And you have both of them. Now, how many of you guys look at the PSI, check the PSI of your tires every year? 
Awesome. And the rest of you are on tracks? Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here's some of the weights that are out there. Now, a long time ago, most of our weights were around 10 ton and axle load or lighter. And that's, I think, where it came, where free saw takes care of it. Because free saw does take care of the top two to five inches. Okay. But that's not all that we're compacting anymore. And they also had alfalfa in rotation. They had a rotation, a much longer rotation, they used animal manures. And so they could break this up a lot better. Nowadays, you know, we're looking, most of our tractors, they started getting about 10 to 13 ton in axle load. Now they're up to 18 ton in axle load. They're heavy. And how heavy are they? Well, this is a class nine combine and it's 20 ton in axle load. So you have a tractor, the same, almost the same weight as a loaded combine running around the field. So you really should take two tractors, have the lighter one to do the lighter things out there for you, the heavier tractor to do the heavy duty pulling. The other thing um, is the grain cart. You know, they used to have more of the 700 bushel one, and that was about 22 ton an axle load, which is still going about almost two feet into the soil. But now the 1200 bushel ones are 35 to 40 ton an axle load. That's now going, um, you know, three, four feet into the soil. And we don't have any equipment that can take care of that. If you take a 2000 bushel grain cart and you fill it up, it is 76 ton an axle load. Okay. I don't even know what that would do to the soil. So what you want to do is have two axles, try to get larger tires, um, you know, because if you get larger tires, you can lower the PSI. And duals, you can do that too. Tracks versus tires. This one, okay, not everybody's going to like my answer. All tracks are different. Uh, if you look how the case is versus John Deere, um, versus cat, they all have a different configuration. The way they get their PSI is it's the length, the width, with the weight of the equipment above, and that gives you a PSI. And on tracks, it could be four or five PSI, which is wonderful. Did you change the axle load? No. Okay, it's weight and PSI. You did not change it. You still have that load, and plus, actually, it's higher with the track because they weigh more than tires. Right. On a tire, it's uh, one to two pounds higher than what you inflate the tire. So if you have a tire at eight, it's putting down nine or 10 onto the soil. And if you have a track at four, you're like, well, that's 10 versus four. Well, I do encourage you, anything under 10, you're doing really well for, for the soil, okay? But if you look at the bogey wheels under there, they have pressure points underneath them and they can spike to about 15. So, it, and the bigger the equipment, the more they'll spike. The other thing to look at is that the carriage does not always fit the track. Have you noticed that? Sometimes they're hanging off six inches on each side. Well, is that carrying any of the weight? Should that be in the calculations for PSI? No. So uh, make sure that the carriage fits the track. Also make a uh, look at the wear and tear on the track. Uh, my father-in-law's, his has wear and tear right down the middle of the track. Okay, so that's not carrying weight evenly or else it would wear evenly across there, right? So just look at those. They are not as even as what they're saying. They are not the end all be all to compaction. You still have the load and you got to be careful. Um, but if you like them for flotation because they let you be out in the field longer before you get stuck, that's good. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm teasing. If um, you like their writability, you know, if you like uh, how they look, if you like all those other things about them, that you can have a smaller tractor that would have the same pull as a larger tractor with tires, great. If uh, you want them because, um, oh, I do. Gosh, there are a lot of good reasons to have a track versus a tire, but that's a personal choice. I wouldn't say to do it because of compaction, okay? If you have very similar tires. Now, if your tires are inflated to 40 and you're comparing it to a track with, you know, seven, yes, your track is doing better. Uh, one guy said, well, I don't care what you say about tracks. Uh, I know that my chisel points don't wear out as fast behind my tracks as they do my tires. And my first question was, what was the PSI of your tires? He didn't know. And it's like, well, then you don't know how to compare. If it's a very high PSI on your tire, then yes, you have more intensity of compaction. If you have a lower tire pressure, then they should be virtually the same on compaction, okay? So just look at those points when you're looking at a track or tires, you'll be fine. It's not, it's just not a silver bullet, okay? Frenchie and I did a study where we went, farmers were saying, well, how long do those ruts last? 
in my field. And, you know, how long do they diminish yield? And you know the year, was it 2009, where it looked like you did tillage with the combine? Yeah. <laughs> Um, they, we went out that year and Frenchie GPSed all these points for me. And then we, the ones that were, still weren't drawn out in the spring, we went into and we got seven fields. And most of them, uh, just a chisel plowed or disc grip, just filled them in. We went out there and we flagged off these ruts and we um, took, you know, their height and their population and their growth stage and then went back and took yield later on. And what we found is that where there was no ruts, it was actually taller corn. Makes sense, right? Uh, population stayed the same. Yeah, even later on in the year, it stayed the same. And then the growth stage was one growth stage ahead. So V10 versus V9. And I'm like, oh, I'll probably go to yield because corn's pretty particular. And what happened was that, yes, it did. It 158 bushel versus 131. And that was a 17% yield uh, decrease because of ruts. And it was very consistent. In those fields, it was 17%. I mean, a lot of times things bounce around, but it, it was pretty tight. So, and here's some of the corn. These were rutted. Of course, we had smaller ones, more zipper ears and things like that. Um, then we went, what I did not plan ahead on is that I had all seven of my fields corn. So what makes them all the next year? Beans. I was like, dang, so I have no second year corn. And what we found out is that, um, well, their height was a little bit shorter. And I was like, well, that doesn't always go to yield. And their population was, that was not statistically significant. And then I looked and it was, um, <clears throat> five minutes, okay. I looked and there were two growth stages ahead and they were flowering more. So more pods and more flowers than the ones that weren't rutted. And I'm like, oh, that's going to go to yield. And it did, which I lost the card. And it was 15%. And I was like, huh. So the third year we went out and I was having a really hard time finding them. We had them GPS, I had the penetrometer and I could not quite find those areas. And we flagged them off as best we could and no yield difference. So the seeing it for three years is, I'd say that's about right. Okay. So what do you do when you have ruts? Did you till at all? They just that? tilled them, yeah, a field cultivation, I, I'm sorry. Either a chisel plow or um, the uh, disc gripper. Okay. Whatever tillage they did, we just said, just fill them in, okay. do it the way you would. Okay. No special university okay. things. So um, now, if structure is your number one defense against compaction and tillage destroys structure, the first thing people want to do when they see ruts is rip it up. Get under there, rip it up, just, you know, get it out of there. So if it destroys structure and you destroy a structure down further, now you're set up for deeper compaction. So I would say just fill them in. You're going to have a yield hit anyway. Okay. So just fill them in as best you can. Don't try to rip it all up. And it seems counterintuitive, but you want to maintain as much structure as you can. Let's talk about if you have a deep compacted layer. So if you have tire compaction, you know, pressing down here, and like I said, I see a lot of that. Do you need to rip the whole thing to get rid of that you shouldn't um, I would like I'd rather you take a zone tiller through and just kind of pop through everything if you have a plow pan area um, and it's at six to eight inches don't take a 20 inch shank down there stay nine inches and get it out of there okay if you have a deep layer compaction come call me because I doubt you do okay um, it was promoted that you have this deep layer of compaction and usually at 16 to 20 inches your soil changes color and those are two different kinds of soils. So if you have um, like a clay on top of, it usually goes down to more sand. You start seeing rocks down there and stuff like that. And um, you know, it's a, it's a bulk density difference. It is not inhibiting to root growth. One more thing, because of our soil types, we have smectites or montmorillonites. We actually have a two to one soil. What is that? I know it's school. It's, a, it's two layers. Um, you have the two, t oh, okay. Just know it shrinks and swells. What does that mean? <laughs> it means, um, does your soil crack in the summer? Almost everybody around here does. And that's doing tillage for you. And as deep as that crack goes, that's how deep your tillage is. Okay. So on those years that are really, really dry and you got a lot of cracks in your soil and you're like, God, I just, I want to get out there and just break it up. And it's like, don't just get your seed bed ready. Okay. 
uh, because that deep t it's doing the, that tillage down there for you. Okay. So you want to know the difference between large equipment does give you the opportunity of being able to do more controlled traffic. And um, that is good. And they, uh, Canada is really big on that and Alberta, and you can uh, go to their websites and they have all sorts of it, but most of theirs is like small grains and not as much for corn. Um, yes, I would like to say, if, if you control nothing else, control the grain cart. Do not go diagonally across your field with a full grain cart. You know, like you load up and then you go to the entrance and then you load up here and you go to the entrance. Now some guys go, but it's good because then people from the road can't see where you have <laughs> smaller corn, and I'm like, okay. But, you know, like with sugar beets, when I see those roads in the middle, I look at it and go, they're controlling their traffic, and that's a great job. They have two areas that are compacted, heavily compacted, and the rest is not as much. So um, tram lines are great. Now, smaller equipment's just going to keep it up lower. They're two different philosophies. Small equipment, you want the larger tires. Controlled traffic, you want the skinnier tires so you're not affecting as much, but you want um, to compact it, actually, make a road. Now, if you do full width tillage, that to me throws, okay, so you can pack this area really well, and then you till it, you throw it, how far are you throwing it? You're throwing your road away and leaving it over there, and you have to reform a road again. So um, strip till does good with that, a lot more of the reduced tillages. But I like the RTK, that's helped us be on controlled traffic and tram lines. So it depends what your equipment is. Um, most guys are trying to get them the bigger tires, more tires, that type of thing. Control traffic, you get the smaller ones, you can also get stuck. But you try to build those roads, you actually have to kind of maintain them and keep the soil in there or else they become a rut. So it's just a whole different philosophy. It depends what you want to try to do. Now you've got to change over your equipment. So if you're in the market for new equipment, you can keep doing that. Because if you have a 30-foot piece of equipment, you need a 90-foot sprayer, not a 60-foot sprayer. So you know, you got to keep, you got to tally it, make sure that you're going on the right path. But it should help save. But so does RTK now. RTK kind of does the same thing where it keeps us in line so we don't have the skips and overlaps, whereas um, control traffic would do that too. Yeah, um, I do like the disc gripper more than a mobile board plow. I think every piece of equipment has a place, um, depending on your situation. So I will not sell, I don't think one piece works for everybody. This one, what I like about it is it usually leaves more residue than a chisel plow. But what I don't like is the depth. Okay, because they usually take this 10, 12, 14 inches, sometimes 16. Uh, chisel plow is usually your eight inches. So if you can stay between eight and 10 and keep as much residue as you can, that's what I like to see. Because residue will help you build your structure. It will keep the bacteria and everything happy. Because the way you build structure, one, you don't tear it apart with tillage. And two, um, bacteria actually create it, you know, and so you got to keep them happy. Don't buy a product of bacteria and put it in there, okay? Because if you don't have a home for it, it's going to die. And so you want to make sure that you make a home for it, and then the bacteria will come. Because in one cup of soil, you have 9 billion microbes. Make a home. Different points on no, that's on the chisel plow on the other one. So what do you like the best? Um, it depends on the soil conditions. So if it's wet, I like to see it narrowed up. Okay, not a wide sweep. The sweep can actually smear the soil as it's going through it. Anytime you have flat metal, you can smear the soil. So you're like, if it stays wet, you'd want a single point. Single point. Mm -hmm. And stay shallow. Stay as shallow as you can. <laughs>